Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke saying hi, how you doing? And the reason why I'm reaching out to you now is I'm kind of setting the foreground for a requirement coming up. And what that basically means is that with our PCs and our cluster environments, we have something that's important to realize. Our user interface environment is really genuinely very significant in the greater scheme of things. So what do I mean? Well, the truth of the reality is when you take a hard drive right here and it says Windows 10 on it, and you install it in a system and you install Windows 10 or Windows 7 or Windows XP or Windows 11 or Windows Lite or Linux, you know, 10,000 different variations of Linux operating environments. When you install these things, it actually represents what you call your user interface. Now, some of you only use a browser for all your interactions. That's kind of technically kind of rare over here on the side. In the middle, we have those people who are productive in the sense of documentation, management, program, you know, controls and things like that. Plus, they may do their finances and then may have some recreational games or something like that. And that's in the middle. And then you have the power users and the administrators, which are over on the, on the other side. And that individual or individuals, they need everything that, that the other two have and a whole heck of a lot more. So what defines the nature of you to be able to use resources? It's about how honest you are with what you need for an operating system. Again, for clarification, operating system as referring to Windows XP, Windows 10, Windows 7, and Windows 11, and uh, Pop, Mint, Ubuntu. So basically, what you call your optimal ability to use a computer to interact for the things you want to do. May it range from personal to exterior, which is like an internet Chrome browser kind of operating system to much more capacity and functionality. So how do you be honest with yourself on this? Because when you go out there to buy a laptop to do what you got to do, if you are more of what I call the console kind of person or a browser type person, Chrome, Apple, Mac, rock and roll, those are probably your best choices because your machine really doesn't do that much. Really. It's just, fairly fast and it could be a little entertaining if it has some functionality to it. Uh, but in a nutshell, you're going somewhere else. You're using something else somewhere else. We call these internet services, paid services, um, applications that kind of point to something exterior to your laptop and so on. Nothing wrong with that. Realize that, acknowledge that first, and then that's the route you want to go. This is probably also a good idea for those who are starting to get up in their years because those systems are more like an appliance than they are actually a computer. Uh, they look for the one or two or three or four icons they'll ever use in their older years, like email communication or vidcom to do a conference call with family and so on and so on, which is spot on. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what most of you are here. The other two is the Windows 10 Microsoft genre and then everything else. So there are some problems with Microsoft, which I'll be very frank with, and it eventually drove me away from using Microsoft pretty much, period. And that is, yep, see right there? What do you call that? That is a CPU. The problem is Microsoft doesn't understand that they can write their software better that it can be backwards compatible and scale to the older processors and still provide performance, but that's not profitable to them. If they do that, then they're not giving you a reason to upgrade to the latest piece of hardware that drives the industry to sell more gear and so on and so on and so on. It's a, it's a marketing strategy, by the way. Um, so they really don't take maximum efficiency of um, the motherboard, the RAM, the NTU processes, the network tra traffic, basically, uh, and um, the CPU. 
as one of my counterparts, Linus, uh, had discovered painfully that I had also discovered, is that no, you try to tweet it, you try to tweak it out, tweak it, tweak it, tweak it. You're just constantly trying to tweak it to get the net card to be super fast, to get the processors to get utilized super fast, and to more accurately and more functionally utilize the processing power of your RAM. And uh, inevitably, they came to the conclusion that there's going to be just a simple line in the sand where you just got to go over the fence and go to Linux. I wholeheartedly agree with them on that. With that being said, in that environment, you kind of have almost exactly the same paradox in Linux as you have with the other two operating systems. And then you discover the secret sauce. That CLI, or the core of the operating environment, really is consistently the same. I mean, Mac is a kind of a version of a Linux. Microsoft is a derivation. That's a, that's a redefinition of their version of what they want to call Linux. Uh, and it's been a long saga. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Many have, and so many have not come back. But um, in the Linux environment, you discover how really truly Windows, Chrome, and, and all the other variances out there work the same, except for the restriction structure of how resources are used. In other words, what we call the INI configurations and the config sys and so on and so on, are basically an attempt to kind of, kind of use your stuff, most of it, not all of it, of course. And uh, so and it also can be very compatible. In Linux environment, that can be completely thrown out the window with using Linux operating environments such as like FreeBSD. Um, and FreeBSD is extraordinarily powerful, but uh, there is nothing there. you got to add everything. You know, it has to be completely built out. It's 100% secure because it's completely de defunctionalized. And that's really the secret sauce about Linux that offers great security is unless you go in and turn it on, it's not on. So many Linux operating environments have failed to support the requirement because they make it too difficult to enable or disable these features. Uh, it, it could literally turn into a long saga of CLI command coding and so on and so on versus having a simple icon out there. And they did it in the old days because it didn't want to look like Windows. Well, time has passed and everybody's finally figured out the secret sauce. It's okay. You can do it like Windows. And actually you have the benefit of that. So with that being said, here's the dilemma. The Linux genre of operating environments is as great, if not greater, than the dilemma you had with a browser-based OS um, you know, the Mac, the Windows, or the basic Linux. Because Linux is no longer basic. It has many releases of what we call distribution operating installable environments, though which can come on, you know, a different form of media, and it can be loaded, and you're doing everything you want to do with it, and you will be able to literally have the exact same headaches as you had when it was just a small group of them in the past. So what I mean by that is there are Linux distributions that are extraordinarily super easy users, like Mac. Uh, kind of look like Mac too, unfortunately. But the reality of the fact is um, they're just really, really curtailed to just doing a few things. Then you've got the very far end, and that is heavy, hardcore environments, Red Hat, FreeBSD, and so on and so on. And these environments have that advanced functionality. And then in the middle is everything else, even including, you know, snappy, quickie, cooly named, you know, Linux operating systems like Pop, okay? Ubuntu is the one that I usually use on the go uh, because, you know, each flavor has a little variation in the command structures, but Ubuntu kind of holds true to a fairly simple structure of commands and it's rememberable because I don't actually use the distro of Ubuntu. I use Mint Ubuntu and uh, Mint gives me some advanced functionalities um, and pulls over some of the lessons learned that when Microsoft Windows discovered and uses those strategies too for efficiencies and faster configuration setups. Now, um, you can play games on Linux just as effectively as you can play games in Microsoft. So all of you guys out there who just want to play games, you really want to play games, play them on Linux. But I digress. 
my PC has 48 processors, 128 gigs of RAM, both 10 gig and one gig connections. And uh, when I attempted to use Microsoft Windows on it, uh, and I looked at the processor loads, I could very quickly see that yes, technically they acknowledge the processors are present, but they don't load them. And you can do that very easily by just simply going over to your task manager, bring up the configurations that can show the individual thread sessions. And you can see literally only six or seven processors are engaging. And that's the big headache there. And then there's a headache about your, your network processing handling and why you can't get the maximum you know, transfer rates with jumbo framing and so on and so on. And then of course, again, the same problem with RAM. You know, it's not handled well. Go to Linux. You get it all pretty much up front pretty quick with a minor amount of, of configuration. And it works really well. But as a side note, I'll say this now because I know that this can cause problems. Make sure your network switching is set up correctly to support those advanced bandwidths because that can stop your network connectivity no matter what config you do. So remember that. Especially if you're spanning tree and things like that. With that being said, um, back to the focal point of the discussion here, and that is what is really what I want for my user interface to get the maximum from what I want? For the basic users who are just starting to learn, go to the low end of Linux or Microsoft or Mac, avoid Chrome for now, and in those environments, unlearn the basics. That's my suggestion. Pop Linux is not bad for introduction. There are a few others out there, but it changes. So I would say uh, with that, you can also go with Microsoft. Uh, the latest operating environment is fine. And you would learn the very core basics. What are those basics? Well, of course, obviously you've got your Microsoft Office or Open Office or whatever you're gonna have for your document needs. You're gonna have your personal stuff. You might have some video, you might have some uh, requirements to do what we call remote administration, where you have to connect to um, your local NAS that you bought that sits on the back shelf or next to the network switch so you can back up your family photos and things like that. Or you may have you know, uh, a need to access resources or you're a young IT person who's got a piece of hardware they want to play with. This is a good way to do that. Now, once you've got that behind your belt, then what you do is you take a piece of paper out. Yep, I said it. Piece of paper and pencil. Write out all the things you did. What do you need? And lastly, what do you want to do next? The key thing about Linux is you can progress. And pro progressing, for instance, like you want to use a Fedora standard or you want to use a Ubuntu standard or a BSD standard, um, start on the fun, easy, accessible versions of Linux and or the basic Microsoft environment. Mac is going to now split away and become more of a console-based interface. And a lot of people sit there and they have a lot of remote administration and that's their job and the Mac's fine. I don't personally like Macs because how the industry of, micro, of um, Apple throws away hardware so needlessly. And just, they, they make... They make giant piles of trash, basically, because they need you to, to expire your hardware and go buy another one, and then go buy another one, and go buy another one. If you want an example of that, look at the Android versus and all the wonderful features of Androids, and then look at a Mac and how they're constantly trying to catch up because they don't want you necessarily having the best and greatest because it's going to last a lot longer and they don't get their profit marks. That's why I'm not a fan of um, Apple products. But back to the topic. Um, like I said, Macintosh environments or Macs become more of a console-based stratagem, which is fine. And they're also a console as in a browser kind of construct. Uh, they, 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 it works. I mean, it's to me, if that's all you need, then get out of the job, you know, get out of the industry and just be, you know, a remote administrator specialist. Uh, for those who are more into the hardware environments, virtual environments, and, and uh, build their infrastructures, probably want to gravitate to Linux on an x86 based system. You can do it on an AMD, which is fine. Uh, that's the same principle with some augmented algorithm controllers. But um, risk processor environments, yeah, they still exist. 
uh, you'll have pro you'll have some difficulties there, um, but not not a lot, not nothing major. It's mostly based on the processor, the performance level, at you know at the at that capacity. But in general, um, you'll gravitate more to toward a Linux side of the equation, um, and then you're going to discover the secret sauce. The, it's two parts. One is called CLI. CLI can be localized and it can be remote using a, 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 a secure shell um, and using an encryption key strategy into remote locations so you can access your environments and using CLL. Now, CLI is basically cl cl uh, uh, command line interface, is what we call it. There's a major drawback about CLI. It is a single mode format of interface. Now, with that being said, is if you know of a problem and you can go straight to it, then CLI is your baby. No problem. But if you don't, and you're working in an enterprise environment or your job is related to handling a lot of resources, CLI is not a great source. What would be more effective is a GUI footprint. That is a graphical user interface that can give you representations on the screen, what we call the red, green, blue, uh, sorry, the red, green, uh, yellow, environment you know green is good yellow is caution red is down kind of mindset which allows you to then use your cli st yeah, strategies on the targets identified now you don't think of it as a big thing but if you're a young entrepreneur it guy coming into the game or gal and you're starting to work on let's say 30 platforms this is where you start to feel the pain when you go from 30 to 300 or 1500 then GUI is very valuable and you might even grow, graduate to what we call web-based strategy GUI such as Datadog or uh, Dynatrace or New Relic and these are platforms many a, a few at least a few servers some resources and RAM and so on that are monitoring all these resources inside your environment for you to give you a single page to work on. In other words, a single pane of glass. This is where CLI fails. CLI is specifically focused with an interface. GUI is specifically designed for the macro environment to the micro CLI instance. And that's where you can start to grow. I use what's called an in-house uh, version of my own macro micro CLI environment. I only CLI when I have to. I'm not a strong CLI -er because I'm dyslexic. It doesn't matter how good I'm in with code. I'm going to mess it up in my head every time. So I have to triple check everything. So I use other levels of interface to accomplish my goals and try to do my best to only use CLI for the core, uh, what we call rudimentary diagnostic steps, logs, uh, services, you know, checking, you know, functionalities and so on. But with that being said, Inevitably, what ends up happening is you have what's called a progression, and it's okay. You can start out on Microsoft and end up on Linux. You could have been on a Chromebook, and then you discovered, hey, I can do this job. And the next thing you know, you've got a piece of hardware under your desk. It rock and rolls, plays all of the games you want to play, and it has an interface to a GUI that monitors all my environments and all my subservices and all my gear in my, in my IT lab. That's what I'm trying to gravitate to. A lot of you have told me it's difficult. It's really hard to go from working on a, a free notebook you got from your uncle and relating it to how do those guys do it on TV. Well, they don't do it because everything on TV is false. First things first. You don't quickly jump on and brrr, and suddenly everything is fixed. It doesn't work that way. In the real life of an IT administrator, as in an architect or even a designer implementer, um, implementer is it's many, 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 many steps and hours of heavy duty work in some cases and hours of not so heavy work, but investigative work. And inevitably you can find the source and it takes time as a representation of that. When the FBI does an investigation, that's a cyber style investigation. It usually at a minimum takes a month to three months before they can bring all the logs and everything into a picture. It's a process. So get the TV out of your head about technical administration 
on computers and just come into the realization that you grow yourself into the steps. That's your real mission. You're going to stop somewhere in the middle. And like I said, if you're a Mac person and you love websites, you're done. You know, buy yourself some cheap Mac and, you know, enjoy yourself on the web because everything you're doing is somewhere else. And Mac may do the job just fine. If you find yourself doing, you know, more of what we call IT, then you'll gravitate to something more like a Linux environment that co-supports what you do. And it's a great reinforcer to teach you how to do command lines and so on and so on so that you don't lose your skill set. That's another thing that fades away over time. And it will give you what you want. Then there's what's beyond that. And what's beyond that is when you've figured out how to do Linux in such a way and or Microsoft in such a way that you can do it all on it. And that means games, personal data, video editing, you know, work related stuff or IT lab related stuff. Then you're finally in your element. And only until you feel that confident in yourself will you get there. And it should be at least two operating systems, maybe three as you go by. So how do you learn that? This is my last part about this particular equation. The way I did it is I used an old tool that no longer works anymore because Microsoft figured out the secret uh, that could allow me to run a virtual box. And of course, they do have a sandbox environment now for you to use, but of course, you need to go up to the next latest and pay money for it. But in the old days, I would just build a virtual uh, a virtual box, put my operating system in there, and play with them, and get a feel. Did it install easily? You know, do I have to you know do a lot of research on you know the basic things I already know in Windows? You know, this, that, you know, the things that you're, would be your pros and cons or your scorecard for that environment. And then you drop that virtual box, you retire it, just let it sit back there in the background, and you build the next operating system. And you do the same thing. And you'll discover very quickly that you can do this also for things like TrueNAS and MediaBox and, you know, all these other uh, quote-unquote virtual uh, services that you can use. Um and learn some from those. So the end result is that you use that test bed, that sandbox per se, to find out what works for you, what snaps for you. And it has to snap for you or you are not gonna be comfortable. Um, in time, uh, you'll learn the other secret sauce trick of having what we call the scripts notebook. And that is basically a, a fast paced copy a notebooking tool that can bring in you know batches of commands pretty quickly to do you know quick executions where you don't have to type it out. Of course, you can always just start typing and hit the tab key in Linux, and it will fill you know fill in the word command for you as well. But uh, overall, in general, um, that's the best way to get comfortable with these environments. You know, just set up a virtual machine. Definitely go through the installation. Definitely go through the setup of the operating environment, explore the tools, and then that boy. Well, this is Brad Dyke signing off. God bless, and you guys take care.